Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us again. My name is Genesis Rodriguez. I'm a public affairs specialist with the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. We have a really cool tour for you today. Uh, we're gonna, you know, go through, briefly go through our ocean monitoring program. It's vast, there are so many components to it, but we're gonna show you some of our favorites. Um, before we get started and before I introduce you to everyone, um, a few things, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature. It's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we can go through them there after, um, after the tour, or you can also use the raise hand feature if you wanna ask your question live. Um, so with that, we have a few guests for you today, and I'm gonna ask them to start their video. Um, let's see here, that way you can all see them. All right, so we have our first guest here. We have Captain Steve, his title, <laughs> Captain Steve. He's the captain of the boat. So he's going to give us a you know, brief little tour of the boat of our ocean monitoring research vessel, the Ocean Sentinel. And then we also have Jojo Lone. She's our senior biologist who's always on deck and who's involved in all the components that we're gonna be going over today. She'll also be here to answer any questions. So she's our expert on hand. So she'll be helping us answer questions at the end of the, the tour. And with that, I will leave it to our first presenter, Josh Westfall. He's our senior environmental scientist. He's going to give us a little overview on the sanitation districts and our ocean monitoring program and the environmental monitoring that we do. And then we'll get we'll head on to like the actual walkthrough video tours of all of it. So with that, Josh, I leave it to you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for spending a little bit of time on your Saturday to spend with us. Um, again, my name is Josh Westfall. I'm an environmental scientist here at the Los Angeles County Sanitation District. And my number one aim today is to tell you a little bit about our mission statement uh, for the agency. So our mission, I know you all can read, but we're gonna go along together. So our mission is to protect public health and the environment through innovative and cost-effective wastewater and solid waste management. In doing so, we wanna create um, waste or create resources from waste, mostly with recycled water, uh, recycled materials, lots of energy. Today, we're going to be focused on environmental protection and how we do that as an agency. So before we uh, move too far along, I wanna spend a few minutes giving you some background about the sanitation districts, our wastewater treatment services, and some of the environmental monitoring that we do. I love maps. I hope most of you do too. Um, here are the sanitation districts. We operate 11 wastewater treatment plants within Los Angeles County and these facilities serve approximately five and a half million people. Uh, they range from out, out in the desert uh, where you see Palmdale Lancaster. We also have the Santa Clarita Valley sanitation area. And then we have what's uh, going to be the focus of this discussion, which is the joint outfall system, uh, where you'll see the bulk of the facilities uh, in your, I guess, lower midsection of the, of the slide. So in terms of the ocean discharge, so what you see where it's highlighted in purple, it says JWPCP, that's the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. Again, listed here as JWPCP. It's by far our largest wastewater treatment facility. It serves nearly three and a half million people as well as hundreds of industries. In 2021, the treated wastewater flow from that facility was approximately 250 million gallons per day. And that was all disinfected secondary treated effluent. What secondary treated effluent means is that a significant amount of the nutrients were removed, um, a lot of 
the things that we might consider toxins were removed. Uh, it's, it's high quality effluent and it's also disinfected because, you know, as you can see, one of our mission's statements components is protecting human health. So we want to make sure that there are no, uh, you know, bacteria or other pathogens that are existing in there. So in addition to treating a humongous amount of, of wastewater, JWPCP also treats solids. Not only do they treat solids from uh, their, I guess, influent area, but they also treat the solids from everything. I'm going to skip back a slide, so forgive me. Uh, from everything in this central area, the solids are all treated at JWPCP. So there's a lot going on there. The solids are removed, they're treated, uh, and they're actually reused beneficially. So the wastewater effluent from the joint plant, as we might call our JWPCP, is conveyed through two continuously operated uh, ocean outfalls. Those extend approximately a mile and a half offshore and discharge about 200 feet in depth. And this is all off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So as an agency, we participate and we conduct local and regional environmental monitoring on all of our receiving waters uh, where our tr treated wastewater is being discharged. The significant difference, uh, if you were to look at, you know, something in the Santa Clarita Valley or something upstream versus the JWPCP is that the receiving water here is the Pacific Ocean. And so it requires a pretty different uh, tool set when it comes to how we monitor for it. Good news is we've been doing this for over 50 years um, in a lot of these instances. So in this coastal area, we collect a wide variety of samples ranging from sediment or water column chemistry samples, as well as biological um, surveys of, you know, the critters that might be living in the, you know, in the mud at the, at the bottom or the fish that are, you know, populating the, the surface waters. And, anything else that we can get our hands on. We've been doing a variety of monitoring for a long time. So one example we have, um, this is the Benthic Community Health Index. It's the Benthic Response Index. That's what we call BRI. Uh, it's a figure generated using our benthic invertebrate and fauna data collected in and around our outfalls off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula over the last 50 approximately years. So first I'm going to back things off a little bit and provide some definitions since uh, not everybody here is a benthic ecologist. And you're going to hear some of these terms in the rest of the tour, so I think it'll be useful. So the first is benthic. Benthic means simply the bottom. Um, in this case, we're talking about benthic sediment. So it is the sand and silt, because that's primarily what we see, uh, sediments that we see from the bottom of the ocean in this case. If you were to look, you know, in a freshwater system, there are still benthic organisms, and it's just, it's the sediment or the substrate that you see on the bottom of that particular channel. Okay, so we've got benthic covered. You'll hear it a lot. Invertebrates are the organisms without a spine. There are lots of critters out there in this environment without a spine. Uh, we're talking about things, they may be worms, they may be crabs, they may be the typical mollusks that you see. So, you know, your clams, your mussels. Um, we do extensive monitoring on these. Now, if we looked at this figure again, now that you have your terminology straight, uh, if we look at the upper left condition, 
Uh, this won't be much of a surprise for people, but we try tend to associate red with bad, green with good, and blue maybe is even better. So if you look at the upper left, this was taken in the early 1970s. And what you can see is that near our outfalls, uh, the condition for the benthos honestly wasn't very good. Um, now, as time, that was around the 1970s. Now, as time went on, we saw some significant changes. You can see, you know, the legends that are underneath the figures. Those were technological improvements that wastewater treatment technology has improved over the ages. And as we improve wastewater treatment technology from baseline to advanced primary to partial secondary, full secondary, and where we are today, things have significantly improved. In fact, things, as you can see in the current status, are mostly all similar to reference condition. What reference condition means is that they're similar to areas with um, similar habitat that don't have any influence from either treated water discharge, urban runoff, et cetera. Uh, so we're doing pretty well. And what I want to say is that we, we do show, I'm only showing one slide today, and this is about, you know, what we're collecting from the benthos, but we collect far more than this. And we collect this for, you know, water, as I said before, water column and sediment chemistry, there's fish sampling, and there's the benthic community. And I'll tell you that everything has followed the same trend. Uh, the only differentiation is that we've seen some trends that were maybe as a result of uh, improvements on industrial waste uh, restrictions years ago, but the sort of the triad of industrial waste discharge monitoring improved monitoring, which has happened, you know, considerably over the years and improved wastewater treatment technology. It has led to across the board, better benthic community health, better uh, fish health and better, you know, what we would call stressor health. So things are doing really well and we're happy to consider, you know, we're happy to continue monitoring this to ensure that everything goes on as it should. So I will say that's, that's what we have for the environmental monitoring. The real topic for today's tour is really how we conduct this monitoring, how we collect this information, and also a tour of our oceanographic research vessel, the Ocean Sentinel and the crew who work on it. So with that, I will pass it back to Genesis to start our tour. Hi everybody, welcome aboard the Ocean Sentinel. My name is Steve Gregson. I'm the captain on board here. Um, I've been with the districts for about 33 years. Uh, the vessel here, the Ocean Sentinel, uh, it's, uh, it was built 32 years ago. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, let me, you've seen the workspace right now, but if we'll look aft on the vessel, uh, the boat is 65 feet overall. Um, it's an oceanographic vessel. We're going to go into the lazarette, which is the furthest aft compartment and a vessel. And I'll show you a little bit down here. This is kind of the meat and potatoes. This is where our winches are located and allows us to go and do a variety of sampling offshore. Let me get in here. Okay. If I could pass Mr. Camera down, I'll kind of show you. Okay, here guys. Wow, look at that. There you go. Anyway, I was talking about trawling. This is our winch. We put it down, located down here in the lazarette. That's three-eighths wire rope. We have about 4,000 
feet of it. I think our deepest trawl was in 1,500 feet of water. As you can see, it goes through a block there. It's fair leaded out this little opening in the back of the boat where the net is attached. We'll leave it inside here. It's attached to that swivel, okay? That's what we're gonna go do a little bit later on. Next week, we're gonna go out and we're gonna be using this other winch here. This is our hydro winch. This is a, this is 3 16 wire rope. It's not as beefy as the main drag winch. As you can see, it's fair leaded through that block, up through, there's a hole in the deck there. And when we go out, when we go up there, you'll see the davit. And anyway, this is what we're gonna to use to lower down that clam shell sampling device. Let me give this to Mr. Camera person again, and I'll be up. So anyway, that's how we deal with kind of this open floor plan. We have the same sampling equipment that's on most vessels, but we just do it a little bit differently. It uh, allows people more access around the deck here. You're not tripping over things. We'll close this up. And uh, here's the davit. The wires hook comes out, comes out here. We'll hook this up to this device. We'll pivot this thing over here. And then the controls are right here. We'll lower it down to the bottom, collect the sample, bring it up, put it in these bins. These bins will go over here. They'll be washed through the sluice box and everything will be caught right here. I want to show you some of the safety aspects to the vessel. These two white canisters on top of the house there, those are life, life rafts. Uh, number two is a 12-man life raft, Solus. And number one is a 24-life raft, uh, Solus B. The Solus A has more life-saving equipment in it. It would be for overnight excursions and whatnot. Solus B is basically close coast-wise trips, and that's what we normally do. Going forward here, this is our lab space. Uh, this is the different gear that we're going to use for the Benthix. Uh, you can see fire extinguishers. Things are labeled, labeled accordingly, accordingly in here. First aid can, um, equipment is there. You can see that because we're on a boat, things roll around. So everything, we have latches, kind of safety proof or child proof everything here but it's a necessity so that everything doesn't wind up on the floor when we go forward when we go out to sea uh, this is our galley here's our here's our main table here the same thing with the latches this is for safety so that we the pots the pots don't roll off into the deck uh, the refrigerators have latches on them to keep everything closed um, tell you what we'll go downstairs now I'll take you into the engine room. Okay. Be careful as you make your way down here. Hold on to the handrails. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, sharp drop there. Okay. Okay. We're gonna keep going aft on the vessel. We'll go down into the engine room. The engine compartment here. This is the next compartment forward of the lazarette. This, this aluminum tank here, this is my fuel tank. I carry 1,200 gallons of fuel. This is our generator. It's a 45 kW generator. This is, a, this is a hydraulic pump that runs those winches. The anchor windlass, the steering on, on the vessel here, it's hydraulics. This is a reservoir for the hydraulic fluid. These are uh, Cummins QMS. Uh, 11s, they produce 610 horsepower at 2300 RPM. Uh, moving forward, we'll go into our work area. This is where we do most of our maintenance. We have our tools, a freezer right here for ice. We use a lot of ice for preserving our, our samples. And we'll go a little bit further in here. This is our, our changing area. Nice thing about the boat, the, all the switches are in the overhead. This is our, our, our changing room. Over on the port side, this is our dive locker. We do a lot of, we do a lot of diving out there. They were, they were diving on different stations on the PV coastline 
way before I came here. So I'm going to say maybe 38 years. Oh, yeah? um, and going forward here on the starboard side comes into our bathroom or the head. It's similar to what you have at home. Uh, a toilet, a sink, countertop. This is our shower right here. And the way that we flush our toilet, a little bit different than what you do at home. Um, we'll push this button and this is a marine head. So what happens, this isn't going overboard. This is going into a holding tank in the bilge. And then at a later date, we're going to go to a pump out location and we'll pump the effluent, our effluent out, the excrement out. But we don't want to, we don't want to discharge anything into the oceans. So pretty much everything is confined here on the boat. And moving forward, we have, be careful as you make your way up there. It's a rather sharp, deep incline. Okay. And then we'll go on the outside. I'll show you a little bit of more storage for the vessel. Up underneath the wheelhouse, we have some more storage for us where we, where we put our gear. Here's our anchor, anchor winch. And then we, what's real nice with this vessel, we have a lot of storage. We have storage underneath the bench seats here that we put gear in. Um, and then you can go inside. Don't be afraid. You can go in there. What we have on this side, you can see all the lines that we have that we might use. And then we have the doors. We have the trawling nets back behind you, back aft. And then if you go and you look over on the port side, we have all of our dive tanks here. Right now, we just got through doing dives a few days ago, so the tanks are being filled. This is gear for the trawl nets. And then you can, if you look aft, you'll see all the wiring for the equipment for my, uh, uh, what I have up on the bridge. And we'll go up there next. Okay. Okay, guys. So if you follow me up this way, we're going to go up to the wheelhouse of the vessel. I've, we'll show you some of the equipment that we use for doing our monitoring. If you come up here, you can kind of see in some of my instrumentation. Um, I've got a GPS unit here, and I've got some software navigation that runs on my laptop. This is uh, an echo sounder that, or a pedometer. This is showing us we're in 16.15.9 feet of water. This is the radar. This will show me other objects out on the water with me. Let's say if it was foggy. And then this is, this is I have a camera system throughout the boat. There's the fantail. And There's the lazarette that we visited with the two winches. Then here's my engine room. So throughout the trip, I'll go back and forth, and then we'll see, we'll see, just to keep up on what's going on on the boat. Okay, and then what, what we'll do when we get out there, you'll kind of see how we use everything when we're, when we're doing, actually doing the sample. Okay. All right, awesome. So now that we did a full uh, tour of our research vessel, let's go out to sea and do an ocean troll.
saying that right now you're looking at the back of the boat, the lazarette. There's the winch that the uh, the net is attached to, and we're deploying we're deploying the wire right now. We're going to put out a, a couple thousand feet of wire. That's going to take us about nine minutes to do it. Here's the coastline here. This is our radar. Kind of it was, if it was foggy out, I'd be looking at this all the time. There's kind of the coastline, as you can see right there. Uh, let me, I don't see any boats out here with me. There's a boat right behind me because I can see it right there. Our position is the very center, center of the screen. I'm going to go, I'm going to put this to a range that is really is better for me to work with. The closer, the better. I can kind of see things. Uh, let me go a little bit more. Okay, now here's our depth right here as we're deploying out. We want to start the net. We want to be on the bottom at 430 feet. So we're getting close to that. I'm going to take it off of autopilot. And you can see our spot right here is this is where we're going to. These are all the stations that we visit. The boats is right here. We're doing a course. The course to the station is 112 degrees. Our course right now is 104 degrees. We're making 3.6 knots, which is a little bit slow. But I still have four more minutes to go. I got four minutes to go, so I got time to, to change things around. But I'm going to be looking at all these things as we get ready to be at the station, because that's the whole thing. We want to start very close to that spot. I'm, what I'm doing with both of these, these, both of these pieces of information is I'm getting input from satellites overhead. And with that information, I'm able, I'm able, think of this as Uber on the ocean. <laughs> I'm able to get to this spot. Uber, I'm doing Uber on the ocean. I'm delivering that net to the spot it's got to be. That's, that's my job. Man, I never knew. So here we are retrieving the net, and as those bridles and yellow cinch line reach the boat, uh, Brent goes down onto the swim step, unclips the cinch line, we'll get that handed up to Chase. Chase will then wrap that around the capstan of the crane. By us using a, a cinch line, it allows for the crane to take the load of the catch rather than us having to pull it up by hand. So you can see the bridles are getting pulled in, but the load is on that stitch line. So here's just another view of the retrieval of the net. And as you can see, that cod end is very full. So again, we use the crane to lift the cod end and swing it over to the live well. We empty the, the cod end into the live well that is filled with ocean water to help keep the animals alive until we can return them back into the ocean. the catch out. Normally what we do for our compliance monitoring is we'd sort out all the fish into species. We would process each individual fish. We'd get uh, the identification, the counts, all of them get put together for an overall combined weight. For the inverts, we identify them, we count them, and we weigh them as well. Uh, for today's purposes though, what we've done is we've separated out some of the more interesting animals and so Brent will uh, start us off with giving us some fun facts 
about the fish. Hi, my name is Brent. We're going to start off today by talking about the California scorpion fish. Um, it's one of our local fish, uh, popular among the anglers. Um, it's extremely tasty. Um, they can get to be uh, about 18 inches long. Um, they'll live for about 50 years. Um, these guys here, one thing you need to be worried about, they call them the scorpion fish for a reason. They are slightly poisonous, so all the dorsal spines, the pelvic spines, and the anal spines are all filled with the venom. Um, so that's why I'm kind of holding them here carefully. Uh, this is an ambush predator. It's got a really large mouth. Typically, it'll just sit down on the rocks, uh, unaware, and just wait for things to go ahead and swim on over it. What else do we have? So while we're still sitting here with our benthic fish that are ambush predators, we have our uh, midshipmen. Um, again, small, wide-bodied owl, um, but a really large mouth. So it's just going to sit there, wait for something to swim over it, open its mouth, and it actually creates enough pressure, it'll suck the fish into it. It doesn't actually have to go up and grab it. Um, the other one here is a stargazer. This is another one that likes to bury itself in the sand. Uh, it's called a stargazer because it'll just sit there and only have its eyes above the sand. And you can see it's got this nicely large upturned mouth. Something will swim over it and it'll just reach in there and go ahead and bite whatever swims over. So it's a stargazer. These ones here have slight venom in these upper spines here, but not as bad as a scorpion fish. And what are all these? dots that I see along the side of the, the fish. So all the dots on the midshipmen here are actually photophores. So these house bioluminescent uh, bacteria inside and they can open and close the, uh, the cells and uh, actually create light underwater and they can use it for species identification and communications. So these are some of our local rockfish species. Uh, rockfish are really important members of the local community. Um, they're slightly problematic as far as management goes. They're very slow growing and they can be really long lived. Um, so like this, uh, the half-banded rockfish here, they can get to be about 10 inches long, or I'm sorry, 15 inches long, and wait, 10 inches long and live for 15 years. Um, and then we have uh, this green stripe one up here, which can get to be closer to 20 inches long and live for close to 50 years. Um, and just like people, they're not able to reproduce until they're about 15 years old. So you can see if you start to take them out too early on, they never get a chance to reproduce and you have a lot of issues with the populations. Um, we have here, so we have a green stripe and we have a green blotch, a couple of the different ones. This one here is known as a half banded, it has a band that goes halfway down. And these are some of our local species. So what we have here is we have a couple of flatfish species. Um, this one here actually has a gill parasite that was uh, coming out of its gills there. So this is an isopod. So think about your little roly polies from your garden. This is one of its marine cousins. Um, it's a parasite, like I said, so it's going to go in there. It crawls into the gill cavity, attaches onto the gills, and then just like a vampire sucks the blood. Um, and it'll stay there. Um, luckily, it's a good parasite, so um, it's not going to kill its host. It's just going to sit there for a very long time and allow it to do all of its work. Um, but these are a couple of our flatfish species. So we have our Pacific sand dab and our local English sole. Uh, one of them happens to be, if you notice, they face different directions. So one's known as a left-eyed and one's known as a right-eyed. So this is our right-eyed fish. Sorry, left-eyed fish, because I'm looking at it backwards. Yeah. And this one's right-eyed. Wait, am I? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right okay. um, what will happen is when these are larvae, they actually start off just like any normal fish. They have their eyes on both sides, on one on each side of the head, and they'll swim around just like nice and normal. And then as it starts to settle and become an adult, the head actually goes through a metamorphosis, and both eyes roll around to one side of the skull, and that way it can go and settle down there and lives flat on the bottom. Um, you know, one other thing you'll notice here is the counter shading that they exhibit. So. The side that's always up and visible is going to be a dark brown, so it blends in with the sand. The other side, they don't bother wasting any energy making pigment, since it's never going to be exposed. And if they do happen to come off the sand, then it's slightly colored like looking at the sky. Now we're turning it over to uh, Chase, and he'll talk to us about some of the interesting invertebrates that we got in the catch. All right, Chase, what do we, what do we have? All right, we got, uh, usually on our trawls, we'll catch a wide variety of uh, inverts. We'll catch uh, lots of different types of shrimp, some crabs. Um, uh, so usually we'll catch octopus, uh, urchins. So uh, in this one, we got a few different things. We've got a couple different types of shrimp. Here we have uh, the larger one is a spot prawn. And the, uh, the smaller one is a ridgeback prawn. Both of these are commercially fished because they're both uh, considered good to eat. Um, yeah. An interesting thing about the spot prawn is it starts its life as a male 
and as it grows older, it switches and turns into a female. And as you can see, the spot crown has this really long rostrum. So they use that as a, as a defensive mechanism. A lot of things like to, uh, when they, uh, like fish, likes to eat shrimp, and when they do, they like to grab it by the head, and when you got a big, big spear sticking out of your head, it's, it's kind of a deterrent. Uh, one of the uh, most abundant things that we catch, especially in our deeper trawls, are these uh, urchins. This is called a fragile urchin. Uh, and it's cr closely, closely related to the purple urchin that you'll see maybe if you go tide pooling. Um, this guy lives in uh, soft, muddy sands, and it, it's, it will eat detritus using its mouth parts here. And detritus is just kind of uh, organic material that's fallen to the, uh, the bottom, like little pieces of kelp, uh, maybe little pieces of uh, dead animals. So it will eat those as compared to its um, relative, the purple urchin, that will eat uh, actually live kelp plants growing on reefs. Uh, another one we caught today, this is a, a sea slug. It's called the California sea slug. And uh, it's related to the sea slugs you might find, or not the sea slugs, just the slugs that you would find in your garden. Except it's a lot bigger. And this is actually kind of a smaller one. They'll get big enough where you kind of have to pick them up with uh, both hands. So they're kind of neat. They have this uh, large foot on the bottom they use to uh, crawl around. And then right here you can see is their, uh, their mouth. And it's kind of interesting. These are actually, they might not look like it, but they're actually ferocious predators. Anything that they can grab with their little mouth, they'll kind of grab onto and pull in, pull. So like little fish, crabs, other, other sea slugs, they're, uh, they're not too discriminate on what they eat. But they'll eat anything they can grab a hold of. Okay, awesome. Hope you liked our ocean trawl. Now let's move on to the benthic sampling that, um, that Josh mentioned earlier. Okay, so here we are getting ready to deploy our tandem van beam sampler. This is a standardized sampler used in ocean monitoring programs. One side is used for biological assessment for the in final community and the other side is used for uh, sediment chemistry analysis. On deployment, the jaws of the sampler are cocked open. When it hits uh, the ocean floor, it allows for slack to reach the triggering mechanism and the jaws will close, hopefully at that point, uh, scooping up full Van Veen um, grabs. Ten and a half. Take a sediment sample. We want to take the top two centimeters. Um, that's typically where all the organisms are going to be found. When you get below that, you wind up in the anoxic sediment, and there's not going to be anything there. Make sure that the jars don't explode. Um, and with the sediment, what we're going to be running, we're sending this off to the chemistry labs to analyze for different metals, uh, DDT, PCBs. Uh, amount of organic nitrogen, and also for grain size. Um, grain size is fairly important because depending on how thick the actual pieces of sand and sediment are, will determine what animals can actually live there. And we'll uh, check these for the color and also their composition based on how they feel. So no odor. Sometimes we'll find that it has a, a hummock smell, which means it's usually going to be rich in organic minerals, or un, which we haven't had for a very long time, a sulfury smell, which means that it's anoxic and there's a lot of bacteria in the, in the so, uh, Silt. Just silt? Just silt. Wait, wait, wait. See if I have that. Oh, okay, I got it. Bottom? Silty clay. Oh, man. 
So this is a Munsell soil color chart developed by, I believe, the U.S. Department of Geology. And it's just a standard set of colors for describing soils. So 2.5Y, 3 over 1. 2.5Y, 2.5 over 1. Now we're washing all these sediments down this loose box into a screen that has one millimeter opening. And that's going to allow us to capture all the uh, critters that are living in the sand and that we'll bring back to our lab where our taxonomist will sort them out and ID them. The little, uh, the little polygon worms. Basically, sieving the samples down to make it more manageable for us to work with so the sample. You see, I had like a big trick earlier. It's going to get worked out to something that can fit in a uh, small jar. So I'm adding magnesium sulfate, which is a uh, fancy word for uh, Epsom salt solution. So we use that to relax the animals for about 30 minutes before we will preserve them with a formaldehyde solution. Then we'll go through, after we put the majority of everything into the container, we'll go through with little tweezers and get the rest of the stuff. The rest of the little animals. All right, and now for our last portion of the tour, we're going to go through our um, ocean outfall inspection, and that will also be narrated by Tara Petrie, our supervising scientist. So here we have the district's dive team members preparing to dive on the shallower portions of the outfall. The district conducts annual uh, external visual inspections of the outfall structures to ensure their continued safe operations. As we jump into the water, Percival lowers down the scooters, which we use to propel along the outfalls. Okay, so here we're on the 120 inch outfall. And as you can see, there's lots of marine life on and surrounding the outfall. There's several different fish species as well as kelp attached to the outfall. This is the 60 inch outfall. And again, you can see all the marine life that essentially blankets the outfalls. There's lots of wavy top snails and gargonians that are attached to the structure. Here we are nearly at the point where the outfall goes below grade. Okay, this is our remotely operated vehicle, also referenced as an ROV. During operations, the ROV remains tethered to the boat by an umbilical cable and the piloting is conducted within the lab area on the boat. Here we're at the ballast rock at the end structure of the 120 inch outfall. As you can see, there's several vermilion rockfish congregating and white giant plumous anemones attached to the outfall. The outfall structures essentially act as an artificial reef providing habitat and relief in an otherwise relatively flat ocean floor. Surrounding this flowing port are pink strawberry anemones. As the effluent exits the ports, there's a shimmery appearance which is caused because the effluent is of a different salinity and temperature than the surrounding ocean water. This will dissipate quickly as the waters mix. All right, there you have it. That concludes the main portion of this tour, the four segments, as I mentioned before, there are so many other components that make up uh, the work that our marine, bio our marine biologist uh, group does, but these were just some of our favorites that we wanted to highlight and show you. So with that, now we're going to move on to the question and answer portion. So we have Captain Steve, we have Jojo Lone, our senior biologist, and then we have um, 
Josh Westfall, our senior environmental scientist. It's you probably see them all here on your screen now. Um, so with that, we'll move to our first, our first question. And again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and then we'll answer them uh, in the order that we receive them. So the first one we have here is, um, where exactly is the JWPCP, the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant located? Well, I, I'll let it, you answer that, Josh. That's pretty easy. It's Sure, <laughs> that's why it went to me. Um, so <laughs> the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant is loaded is located just off of the 110 freeway. It's approximately at Figueroa and um, Sepulveda in the city of Carson. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so right near the intersection of Figueroa and Sepulveda. And if you're interested in a tour, please send something to q and I'll also put a link there. Actually, no, we are having a tour on August 13, I believe. So I will put the link in the chat. We're taking an entire tour of our joint water pollution control plant. That's our largest wastewater treatment plant. And we'll be doing that virtually as well. So um, yeah, I will put that in the chat. All right, um, next question. Are any of these fish restricted for fishing? How is that enforced if so? Uh, I'll take that. So I'm Judge everyone. Uh, so th this is a, a little bit of a complicated question. So are, as far as the fish being restricted, there are health advisories in place for certain types of fish that we see off our coast um, and, and also consumption advisories. So these fish, they, uh, they can uh, bioaccumulate certain types of toxins in their tissues. So what the California Fish and Wildlife, um, so the Department of California, it's the Department of California Fish and Wildlife, they actually put out these health um, advisories and also consumption advisories are posted on their websites. And these are usually posted along areas where folks go to fish off of piers, um, beaches and stuff. And there's a list of fish that are um, reported on these postings. They're also the ones who would, um, okay, so that's the first part. The other part is there are certain areas in the, along the Palos Verdes Peninsula where uh, the public is not allowed to fish. And those areas are called um, marine protected areas. And we do have one area off of Palos Verdes that is a marine protected area and absolutely no fishing um, from the public can occur there. For scientific purposes, uh, we are allowed to collect there and um, it is part of our permit that we're required to do that. So, uh, so yeah, that was a little bit of a, a, a deeper question, but I hope that answered it. I hope so. And if it didn't, please feel free to add a follow-up question in the chat. Um, another question we have, have you identified evidence of oil or gas or other toxic spills? And if so, what do you do when you see that? So this sounds like a spill question. Um, we do monitor when we're out in the field, we're actually collecting observational data to see if there's like oil slicks or debris or trash out in the water. I personally have never seen it in my years here at the districts, but it is something that we do monitor for um, while we're out there. I'll follow up on JoJo's answer since she in my opinion, direct it in a really nice way <laughs> that if we're talking about spills, the, the most common type of spill that we might see would be uh, something along the lines of a sanitary system overflow. And we do extensive monitoring with, uh, certainly with the Marine, in partnership with the Marine Biology Group. Uh, and they are very, you know, qualified and diligent at looking for the evidence of any you know, any impacts of spills that may have been identified on the freshwater side of things or on the inshore side. And we all work, you know, in tandem to make sure that any impacts are identified. But, you know, the reality is that 
for the most part, and this is something to be thankful for for all of us, is that more often than not, once things hit the once things hit the marine environment, that there's such a tremendous amount of dilution that impacts are pretty difficult to identify. All right, thank you for that. So again, if you guys have any questions, whether it's about the boat, anything else, we do have Captain Steve on the line, so feel free to ask, um, feel free to ask away. All right, so next question we have here, how many people work in your program? Ooh. Uh, so there's two, uh, there's at least two different groups being represented in the Zinco right now. I'm part of the marine biology group. We have about 12 people in our group. Um, and then Josh is part of the reuse and compliance group. And I'm not sure how many people exactly are in your group, Josh. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's kind of a, a nuanced thing because, you know, there's such a partnership involved here that, you know, if we wanted to involve everybody who conducts the chemical analyses on all these samples, and we're talking about dozens, if we're talking about the people who, you know, do the hard work and go out and collect all these samples, then it's just as Jojo identified. Uh, if we're talking about, you know, those of us who, you know, put together a, a, a report, uh, you know, there's maybe another dozen. So, it's it's pretty difficult to you know put a definitive answer on the number of people, but if we were to say who the number of people who are involved that you know maybe touch these samples or the data, it's certainly dozens. All right. So our next question is: um, How would the maturity of fish be monitored for fishing? to ensure ability to reproduce? So the, um, I'll, answer, I'll take that one. So the California D Department of Fish and Wildlife, that's the word I was trying to say earlier. Um, they actually put out uh, a length requirements for uh, the size of fish that we can actually collect. So anything that falls outside of, it's like a range usually, anything that falls outside of that range, um, we're not supposed to uh, collect. So we just, we just leave them be. All right, um, next question. How does your research and monitoring address the DDT issue in that area? Um, okay, so I can probably answer one side of this. So we do collect in regards to the earlier segment with the benthic um, sediment collection. That's where we're actually collecting the sediment that may contain, um, that we're monitoring for different parameters, including DDT. Um, those samples are then sent to our chemistry group that Josh had just alluded to, one of our other groups. And then they are the ones who um, determine the levels, if there are DDT um, constituents present, and if there are the amount of, of those constituents present in the, in the samples. At that point, from then, um, the results that they uh, report then get sent to Josh's group. Um, and then they uh, they do their portion of it, <laughs> reporting those levels and uh, the effects that um, the effect that it's having in the region at the time. I'll I'll add on, just everything that Jojo said is one hundred percent accurate. You know, from our perspective, we we do extensive monitoring for DDT. You know, we recognize and, and for all of you who have perhaps been on a boat tour before, you know, when we were able to do these in person, it's something that we actually highlight that, you know, historically there was a direct connection from a, the DT manufacturer, the Montrose Chemical Company to, uh, you know, to our sewers. And a significant amount of DT was discharged over the years that was cut off. And it's been, as you know, it's been a super fun site and a source of remediation for, you know, longer than probably many of the people on this call have been alive. Uh, there's been significant progress. It's something that we continue to partner with the EPA on. And if I can find the best link, I will post it in the chat for the current progress. Um, 
if people are specifically asking about the DVT barrel issue, which I know came up on last year's virtual tour, um, the link should again cover it, but it's not something that the sanitation districts have much, we have no authority over and we don't have much information on other than what's publicly available since the uh, site of the barrel disposal was really, really far off of, of the coast, almost halfway between the coast and Catalina and well outside of the boundaries that we do monitoring at. Nonetheless, we do continue to be a partner with EPA and with local agencies and, um, and research outfits when it comes to seeing what can be done about these issues. But again, I'm gonna look for that link that I, I would have it available if I didn't just receive it like a day ago. So I hope that answers your question mostly. Okay, and if not, please include a follow-up question. We'll be happy to answer. Um, all right, so next question. How many samples do you take a year? Um, well, I'm gonna say, I can't put an exact number on it, but I'll, I'll say dependent upon the type of survey we're doing, combined hundreds, hundreds, easily in the hundreds. So we do like benthic sediment collection. We're also doing water um, collection as well. We're, we're collecting discrete water samples. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's, and it's throughout the year. So yeah, it's, it's easily in, into the hundreds. All right, awesome. And um, let's see here, our next, well, this will be a question for all of you. Um, what is your academic background? And so first we'll start with uh, Jojo, the academic background, and then we'll go with Josh and then Captain C. Uh, sure. So I um, I actually double majored from uh, Cal Poly, Cal Poly um, Cal State Long Beach. I um, majored in marine biology. Woohoo! Go Beach. <laughs> um, I majored in marine biology and also environmental science and policy. And then while I was working at the districts, I also earned my master's degree from Loyola Marymount University in environmental science. Awesome, and you, Josh? Hi, everyone. Uh, similar to Jojo, so no, no go be chair, by the way. Um, so my right. undergrad was at UC Davis uh, Environmental Policy Analysis and Planning with water quality emphasis. And then again, while employed at the sanitation districts, I earned my master's in uh, civil environmental engineering at Loyola Marymount and am a board certified environmental scientist with the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. Oh, awesome. Here. Yeah, Captain Steve, you're next. Okay, I, I was gonna tell you that my education started when I was very small or 15, 16 years old. And uh, it, was, it was pretty nice. I went out on boats and I fished and I was able to get a job there and just stayed with it. And then when I had enough, when I got to, um, when I had enough sea time and I reached the appropriate age, I sat and I got my Coast Guard captain's license. And then I was lucky enough to get um, a position with another organization on a very similar style boat that you saw today with the University of Southern California. And uh, I operated that for about 10 years, but in half of that time, um, I had accumulated more sea time and I was able to up my license to a master's. And then as you keep going and you take more classes, every five years, you have to renew your license. And then you find out what the Coast Guard wants you to take. You keep taking continuing education classes. So I've just followed that route, been there, done that for a long time. And I have my captain's licenses. So. And you started how long ago? 
my math ability isn't that good. I couldn't tell you. I was 15. At the districts? No, no, no. I started in the industry when I was 15. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I started with the districts probably 34 years ago. Yeah, so. that, that's pretty cool. I think you mentioned that when you started, they were building the Ocean Sentinel, right? I was very fortunate in that, yes, yes. Um, uh, my immediate supervisor, Joe Maestral, had already laid the groundwork for building the vessel you saw. And um, the, the, the previous captain, Rusty Shields, was getting ready to retire. So it just turned out, I kind of walked into like the perfect situation. I, within two months of being employed with the districts, I was on my way up to Washington, Washington State at Westport, uh, Washington. Westport was the shipyard that built the boat. And I was there with Joe Maestral and I saw the vessel that I was going to be able to operate and maintain you know, just a couple of months after being hired here. And then about four or five months after that, I went up with Joe and another individual and we brought the vessel down from Washington down to where we tie the boat up in San Pedro. And we've been using it ever since. Um, shortly, at, let me, shortly after that, within, within another year, we brought the vessel back up to Westport Shipyard and we had some design changes done to the, the hull of the vessel because the vessel is very, very stable and sometimes it'll, it'll rock very quickly. So we put on these, these extended fins by the hull and they really slowed down the motion of the vessel and made it more accommodating for everybody when we go out. Okay, awesome. So Pretty much the Ocean Sentinel research vessel is almost like your baby. You like you were there when it was a little newborn. So well, it's getting ready for college. So I think it's past college now. No, it's like over 30 years old. So you know what? Can't get them out of the house. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So the next question: um, what if anything is being done to have more diversity in the workforce? Um, so this is actually a very cool question. The sanitation districts do recognize the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workforce. It is essential to have successful operations. Um, two years ago, we hired a DEI consultant to do a full assessment on our agency and how we were doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, we've gotten the report back and we're starting to follow through with the recommendations made. Um, we also have a DEI officer that should be starting at our agency soon. So we're very excited about that. And we also have a whole task force made up of different staff members throughout our agency. So something we take very seriously. And uh, we have, I'll put up a link to our annual report, actually, if you want to know a little bit more information on how we're spread out in terms of, you know, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, so thank you for that question. So next question is, um, do you ever have public tours on the boat? Um, we have, uh, pre-pandemic, we, we were offering public tours, not public tours, I'm sorry, we were doing board of directors tours. We don't do public tours, but um, it's something that I'm not sure you know, with the state of the world right now, I'm not sure if that's ever going to be, uh, if that's ever going to be implemented again. So I can't really, I just can't predict what's going to happen. I would predict most likely no in terms of strictly public tours. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the vessel is a pretty significant expense to, to operate. And one of the one of the primary goals that we have as an agency is to do everything we can do in a cost-effective manner to our ratepayers. Um, you know, you could see this if you saw the full tour that we we actually have you know incredibly low rates compared to most of our um, neighboring or similarly sized agencies across the United States, and 
you know, it's one of those things that it gets challenging that if we were to, if we were to just simply open up public tours that uh, it would have to be, um, at, if nothing else, regulated or balanced in terms of, you know, impact to rate payers. Awesome. And I will add a little bit of insider information since you're here. Um, as part of our Clearwater project, which is a construction of a new seven mile long tunnel, um, we are looking into having um, partnering with other educational programs like Think Earth uh, to be able to provide kind of similar boat tours to the public. And if you want to know more information, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, any one of those, and we'll keep you guys posted. It's still, we're still in the, you know, brainstorming phase, but we do hope that, you know, through this partnership, you know, more people can have access to, to be able to go out. Um, but um, yeah, that's, uh, it's very cool. But we do have ocean, I mean, we do have virtual tours, which I argue are a lot more fun because you get to see a lot more than you would if you were in person. I had gone on a tour of the research vessel before that, but like, I had never gotten Steve's tour of the entire boat. Like I had never been down, I don't know what you call it. I'm going to call it the basement, but I'd never been like down there. And I'd, yeah, I'd seen him where he's like, you know, at the wheel, but that that's about it. I'd never actually taken a thorough tour. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And we'll try to, you know, keep doing these virtual tours of the research vessel and add more features to it so that you learn even more every time you join. And you will not get seasick on a virtual tour. Exactly. You will not get seasick on a virtual tour. Yeah. So it's like best of both worlds. Uh, um, but again, um, if you want to be kept up to date on tours, please follow us on social media, or you can go to that page that I listed on the chat. It's www.lacsd.org slash tours, and you'll see our tour schedule for the rest of the year. Um, but yeah, very cool. Um, okay, so next question. What have you found the general health and condition of the fishery to be in the research area? It's getting Josh, better. Do you want to feel that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I, I would say, I mean, it's really similar to what I showed with the um, Benthic community population data that there were clearly some impacts um, 50 ish years ago. And over the years, with improving treatment technology, improved and increased monitoring efforts, um, that the fish community looks pretty healthy now. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, now we're talking. Um... Let's see, what is the strangest or most interesting thing you have seen on the job? Well, out on the boat, <laughs> uh, I'd say that the most interesting thing was something that we don't get normally in our catches. And it was a, what's called a seven arm octopus. It actually has eight arms, but it's just called a seven arm octopus. It's um, I believe it's cosmopolitan, like it's found in different areas of around the globe, but, um, and it's been seen in the Pacific Ocean before, but uh, we had never seen it before. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool. It was a juvenile. It's actually um, one of the two largest octopus species in the world. Um, the other one being the giant Pacific octopus. So yeah, being able to, to see that was a highlight for me. That's cool. Uh, Josh, what about you? Okay, I didn't see this. <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, I, was, I was landing in Sacramento for a work meeting and watching the news. And on the news, I'm seeing the reports of hey, we just found, um, you know, a, a dead body in a sewer, uh, you know, going into a water reclamation plant in Bassett, California. And my first thought was, where in the world is Bassett, California? And so, you know, I look it up on my map and, oh, 
it is right next to our administrative offices and right at the plant that we worked at. So that would be the strangest or you know, most intriguing thing for me. All right. So I think we met on the boat, <laughs> but that took a dark turn. Okay, Steve's very eager to answer and I'm scared to hear what his response is because he's- No, I've seen some pretty interesting things. I mean, talking about, I think Shark Week has started and we just saw a small white shark out on the boat. Oh, I've seen cool. a hammerhead. I've seen a hammerhead shark. I've seen a sea turtle. I've seen probably the weirdest looking fish that I know of, which is called a ratfish, which basically looks like a possum, but it's a fish. And um, I think that's it. Those are the four most unique things I've seen out there. But a sea turtle, that was pretty amazing. That is really cool. The strangest thing I've ever seen, but it's not strange to any of you, are like the sea slugs that Chase was showing that fit in like the palm of his hand. Only it was like, like this big. It was, I was blown away. I, I think I had to take a picture. I was like carrying it with two hands, but I know that's not strange at all if, if you're working out there in the boat, but for me, I'd never seen anything like that or even heard anything like that. Um, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, and they're all strange the creatures. They're all strange creatures. That's why I love, love what I do. Coming across the strange and unique. Yeah, that's what makes marine biology uh, really cool and exciting to see what you find. Um, and speaking of marine biology, um, Someone asked a question about the pay and is does it pay well? Do these careers pay well? I have kind of an answer. Uh, our career, our salaries are very competitive with you know other local agencies. Um, so yeah, take a look. Um, we have government benefits as well. So if you're interested in a career at the sanitation districts, I will post that link also as well. You can go to um, lacsd.org slash jobs. And there you'll get a list of all uh, current job postings that we have available. But yeah, it's it pays well and it has great benefits, so. Yes, yeah, so I'll follow up with the pitch that, you know, that we have from our treatment plant tours. The, the sanitation districts, I mean, for the vast, vast majority of the people that you would pull, it's a great place to work. Um, and we actually have incredible diversity in the jobs that are offered. So we have, we have painters. We have, um, I will tell you the treatment plant operators are a very, very sought after um, commodity. So it's just great to look at what jobs might be out there with the link that Genesis provided and see what might happen to fit any you know, individuals skill set or interest level and that there's always people available at the sanitation districts to um you know inquire with if it's something that you're interested in and want to know more about it yeah josh makes a good point it takes a village um to run this agency and it's not just marine biologists environmental scientists although you guys are fascinating and awesome um but there are so many other you know, jobs that are required to make all of this work. He mentioned we have operators, we have electricians, we have pump technicians, we have um, maintenance people that actually have to do inspections and provide maintenance to our 1400 miles of sewer throughout all, all of LA County. Um, you have public affairs people like me, you have people in the finance department that could be accounting, purchasing. It's and then we have engineers, all types of engineers, mechanical, civil, environmental, um, electrical. So it's just a wide, wide range of jobs of, of what it takes to, to run this agency. So yeah, if you're interested, um, go to lacsd.org slash jobs uh, to learn more. And we also have internships. So we have you know, internship positions for engineers. I know we have some for our operators. And we have some for, uh, we just started our internship program for electricians and stuff. And I think Marine Bio, you guys get some too, right? Yeah, we have um, a one 
uh, internship position. Um, it's yeah. filled right now, but it does get open periodically. So definitely keep a lookout and it gets posted on. It on gets posted the, on that. Um, if you go to that website, it'll yeah. send you a link um, and those internship positions get posted. And typically most of them I would say are before summer begins, but again, you might see some come up throughout the year and they pay very well. And they're also just a great learning opportunity <coughs> your resume going. All right, so let's see if I, okay. So we'll close with our last question for the day. Uh, will this tour be available to watch in the future? Yes, this specific tour will be posted on our YouTube channel. So I will post our YouTube um, URL. You just have to go to uh, youtube.com slash Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. It's a little long, but yeah, if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see our whole library of tours, including this one. This one should be posted by like Monday, I believe. Um, so if you missed it, or if you wanna go back, um, please feel free. If you have any other questions, um, you can send us an email at info at lacsd.org. There are a group of us that monitor that email so we can answer any other questions that come up or we can get you connected to Josh or Jojo or uh, Steve as well. And uh, with that, thank you guys so, so, so much for joining us today. We hope you had a great time uh, learning about our marine biology program and our research vessel and how it operates. Um, please reach out to us if you have any other questions. And uh, we hope to see you on the next one. Our next one is a tour of the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. So we're going to be answering the question, what happens with your sewage? It's our largest wastewater treatment plant. It operates uh, about 260 million gallons of water. It, it treats 260 million gallons of water a day. So that'll be August 13th at 9 a.m. as well. And with that, we'll leave you guys to enjoy your Saturday. Saturday. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.